He has been involved with hacking both offensive and defensive since 1980s. His diverse background includes topics such as information security, signal detection, machine learning, natural language processing (NLP). Before co-founding Rizback, he worked three decades with information technology, founded and ran two video game companies, produced dozens of products, and he served in both U.S. Marine Corps as well as U.S. Army National Guard. So I want to welcome him on stage. I would like to call uh, Mr. Vijay Balarao, our secretary, to felicitate Thomas. I greatly appreciate being here. Uh, I'm one of the organizers at B-Sides Charm, which is a security conference in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States. Uh, and I can speak from experience that running a conference like this is a lot of work. So this is going very well, and I think you guys have done a great job here. Um, so a little bit about me first before I start. I I'm a technical guy. My name's Tom Phillips. Uh, you may wonder, who's this unusual guy with this long hair up on the stage? Um, so I've, uh, I've done software development for over 30 years, uh, many different programming languages. Um, I've been involved in hacking, both offensive and defensive, uh, starting in the 1980s. Um, I've been in the United States Marine Corps and also served in the United States Army National Guard. Um, so when I was in the Marine Corps, a story here, uh, I had no hair. I cut off all my hair because I was a Marine. And when I finally got out, I got married and had kids, started a family, and I started growing my hair out and I said, with, my, with my family. I said, well, if I have to go back and fight, then I'll cut my hair off. And um, in 2001, there was the World Trade Center bombing in the United States and New York City. And uh, when that happened, I immediately went and signed, volunteered for the Army National Guard and cut all my hair off again. Uh, I went back and I did electronics repair there for a while, for a few years. And then I got out, and once again, I said, I'm just going to let it grow out unless I have to go back and fight. So I haven't had to go back for any reason, so I just let it grow. Um, my other things in my background, my, I've got an interesting academic background. A lot of people go and they study one subject or maybe two, but I've actually studied many different subjects. Um, computer science is probably my first love. Uh, I've also uh, done a lot of psychology. I have a degree in psychology. So I see the world... Uh, in a lot of different ways. I, I see it in terms of uh, what's possible, what can you compute, what's probable, uh, what's it cost to compute it. And I also uh, see the world in terms of people, both in terms of what are people like and what do people do, but also from a military background in terms of conflict, uh, because sometimes people uh, engage in conflict. And so a lot of these things are going to come out in this presentation. Um, I'm going to go here to the first slide, and this is probably the most important slide of the presentation. Uh, and then later on, I'll let you know what the second most important one is. So I have bad news to start with, unfortunately, uh, which is the way things are going now, uh, if we don't do something different, it's going to get to the point where it's not going to make sense to use IT equipment, not computers or networks or anything. The reasons for this are because the cost of people attacking these systems are going down dramatically. And the cost of defending these systems is going up dramatically. And there are a number of factors for this. Uh, on the cost of attack side, um, what we see are, e even events like this, what's happening is we're essentially training the bad guys. So everything that goes on in security, the bad guys watch. And, and who are the bad guys? The bad guys, I saw this, uh, this bifurcation, this split in, in people all the way back in the 80s where people got into hacking and it was kind of a way of life and a way of looking at the world. And people split into two groups and some of them went off to be good guys and they did good things in life. And some of them went off to be bad guys. And they said, oh, I can use all of these, all of this knowledge for, for crime, basically. So on the attack side, we're seeing that they get a lot of reward. There's very low risk because of the anonymity. Uh, they use open source. They, there's an open sharing of information about security tools. Um, and and they, they grow from that. Any release of information about how systems are secured or how attacks are conducted, uh, they eat that up. 
And then there's this global interconnectivity. So we don't have just a link from here to there. We have links everywhere. Everyone can talk to anyone. And so when you join the internet, for example, you're essentially connecting yourself to every other computing device on the planet, uh, which is a, kind of a scary proposition. On the cost of defense, um, things are making it harder and harder to detect people and pull them out of our networks, pull them out of our machines. Uh, we have new technologies coming up all the time. So every time a new technology springs out, we have to think, well, how do I secure this one? Because we don't compute or network with formal systems, formal systems in a mathematical sense. And I'll, I'll talk about some math later, but not too much. I don't, this is not a math talk. Um, we, we have the Internet of Things, where every little device is attaching to the Internet or to local networks. And we also have this thing called the curse of dimensionality, which doesn't make sense here yet, but I'll get to a slide in the future here, and it will make more sense. And it's this idea that we think that if we collect big data, if we gather up lots of, it, lots of information, and we think that if we apply very intelligent algorithms, machine learning algorithms, we think that, oh, AI is going to solve our problems for us. And the reality is that there's actually something called the curse of dimensionality that works against us. And it requires us, the more smart our algorithms become, the more data they require. And that data requirement actually grows faster than the data that we have is uh, available. So the most important one here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to walk you through some stuff. I'm going to say how we got here. So I'm going to talk about the past, a lot of the things, experiences from my past. Uh, and then I'm going to craft a model, uh, present a model, not a formal mathematical model, but a different way of thinking about what's going on. It's not the simple, I have my network and I want to protect it. It's something different. Uh, and then what the future looks like, at least through my eyes. So in the past, so I'll go back in the 80s, which is when I got started in hacking. Um, computers were new, at least for many of us. Um, they, you know, big ones have been around for a while, but the personal computers, the ones that, you know, you could get your hands on something, that was new, and they were hard to use. Um, all the command, all, all the things that we take for granted that are just intuitive now, the user interfaces, whether it be command line or, or uh, user, uh, graphical user interfaces, none of that had been invented yet. And so you might have something like a Unix system with very cryptic commands at the time, like ls and mv and rm, which didn't make any sense. They were just these letters, and you had to muddle your way through it. And as a result of it all being new, there was this push by the developers of this software and these, these hardware systems to make them as easy to use as possible. Now, ease of use back then was very different than what it is today, but still, they tried very hard to make sure that if some random person came in and had to use this uh, IT equipment, IT programs, that they'd be able to. They'd be able to somehow, either with a manual or just interfacing with it, um, get through it. So, obtuse command. So, some stories here. Um, SMTP, simple mail transfer. Protocol. So like an SMTP server, I don't know if any of you have had to interact with that, but it's, it's one of the ways that we transport email from, from computer to computer. So there were systems like that back in the 80s. And you can actually connect to them, and, and uh, you connect using a modem, and you get uh, little prompts, and then you're like, what do I do? And you didn't necessarily have uh, plain English commands, you didn't have graphical interfaces, you had these cryptic commands that you had to type in. So for example, if I wanted to start talking to a mail server, I would have to type in H-E-L-O, uh, which is an unusual thing. And if for whatever reason you did drop into a machine, uh, like you got sat down at a Unix machine, like I was saying before, you had these cryptic commands like LS and MB, which today, for anyone familiar with Linux, are very, it, it's, you know, it's the way it is, you just know. But back then, these things were just really arcane. And there wasn't documentation on these things. There, there wasn't document. There may have been somewhere, but the problem was there wasn't an internet. There weren't cell phones. And so if you had to learn how to use something, you had to go get a physical printout from somewhere, or you had to interact with the system itself, and it had to tell you what to do. So for example, a lot of these systems had help commands. You could type in help, and it would spin out, uh, spit out some online documentation to give you some 
some ideas about what types of commands. And so from a good user perspective, you needed that so that you could interface with these new systems that did things that uh, were, were very novel at the time. From a bad guy perspective, those were instructions on how to get into the system and how to do things. And so if you could find a computer that you could connect to, because you know there wasn't the internet back then, so there was a different way to get to computers. If you could find a computer to get into and you could do so anonymously, you could use this online help system to help you navigate the system and do whatever it is that you wanted to do. So I'll, I'll talk a moment about war dollars and how you got into that uh, those systems back then. So computers, you, you could either go physically visit a computer or you could connect to it via a modem, uh, which was communications across. Some of them are still around. Uh, back then, they were pretty primitive. Uh, it was a noise on the phone, and you'd put it in a little cradle, and it would translate the digital signals into the analog signals for the phone line. And that's how you would get to the machines. And you'd have to dial the number, and the machine on the other end would automatically answer the phone for you. And but you didn't know what numbers, let's say you're a bad guy, and you didn't know what numbers the machines were attached to. You didn't know what's out there. So you'd have a program called the War Dollar. The War Dollar would take your modem, and it would make it automatically dial every phone number. And it would just go one, two, three, and every possible phone number. You'd start it in the evening, after everyone goes home from work, or home from work, and you let it run all night, and in the morning you go and check on it, and you get a log, and you'd say, this number, and this number, and this number, all picked up with computers. And then you knew where you could go into the next day. And then you would go back, and you would connect to those machines, maybe the next evening, and you would interrogate them, and try to find out what kind of machine you're talking to. And they were very friendly, usually. Because commands were obtuse, computers were new. And so the message here is that we've come from a place where machines were hard to use, and we tried to make them as easy to use as possible. And in doing so, and trying to do what we thought was best for the users, we actually made it easy for other people to get into those machines who didn't belong. Now that, in and of, in and of itself, is not too bad a problem if you correct it. You say, well, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to make it harder to use. And so every time you needed to um, expand at a new function, you had to stick it on to what was already there, what was already in place. And some examples of this. So today networks, we have uh, switches, and you can just plug in a cable, an RJ45 jack, and just add a new computer. Back then, there were these coaxial cables, which had the signal on the center and then a shielded, uh, shielded wire wrap around the outside that was all wrapped in plastic. And if you needed to add a computer to your network, the signals went down this one single cable. And if you needed to add a computer to your network, you had to cut this cable physically, insert a tap in between it that, that made a T, and then put that T into the next computer. And then all of these computers had to share the same bus. So not only were you cutting the cable and adding something to some system that was already in place, but you were also taxing the system by the new system that you added had to share that same cable for the data, the data transmission. It was a bus. And so there were only so many computers you could stick onto this before you had to figure out something else to do and expand it. And this is an example of growing through accretion. We're just sticking something on. And when somebody, a tech, had to go and figure out where they're going to make that cut, they didn't necessarily know where the best place was, and so they'd make a cut. And then you might have to swap out cables later. Um, so it was very clunky, and it wasn't scalable. It wasn't scalable. Intel processors went through a similar growing phase. Now, now we've grown out of those, and now we have switch networks. They're different. But Intel processors were similar. So there were the 8086 processors. I don't know if anybody remembers those. Uh, the late bit things. Um, there was a, a war going on, a battle between Intel and Motorola at the time. Motorola, I, I prefer what Motorola did with the 6800 and 68000 series. They had a much cleaner architecture that naturally grew. Intel's architecture did not naturally grow. There wasn't an easy way to take the Intel architecture for the chip 
and say, oh, now we're going to support 16-bit program, 16 programs. Oh, now we're going to support 32-bit programs. They didn't, that wasn't built into that. So there was this clunky thing called segments. And so you actually, when you wrote machine language for these chips, you had to worry about memory segment, segments that actually overlapped. Uh, and, and this overlapping was an artifact of the segment register that you used. But the, the story is that as, or, or the, the, the important part of, that, part of that story is that for Intel to support future programs and be backwards compatible, it had to grow through accretion. It had to add things to its chip that didn't necessarily break the old things, but allowed you to do new things. And Windows did the same thing. So Windows, the Windows uh, 2, the Windows 3.0, the Windows 3.1, 3.11, I don't know if anyone uh, remembers those, but it was a similar issue. Uh, they needed to try to preserve the look and feel of the graphical desktop while adding new features without breaking the old ones, because what, what do your users do if you break something that was backward compatible, right? You get all these calls and they say, hey, why isn't this working anymore? You can't say, oh, we don't support that anymore. That, that usually doesn't fly. It never has. Um, and then on the programming side, Windows did the same, Microsoft did the same thing with Windows. They had these programming calls, these APIs, and there were the old ones, and then the, there were the new ones, and they had to coexist, and they couldn't just cleanly pull out the old ones and drop in new ones. They had to keep supporting the old stuff. It was the growth for accretion. Now, going back to the other thing, we had things were inherently easy to get into, and now you're looking at, well, we don't actually plan out our architecture, it's just kind of naturally growing. There's this organic growth. Eventually, people got the idea that security is a problem. Now, security was actually a problem long before you saw it in the media. Um, it, way back in my day, uh, in the 80s, um, the word was, if you want to hack, the first thing you do is you go to a university, either physically or remotely. You break into their computers. And if you break into their computers, they're very easy to break into because the university folks didn't care much. They wanted everyone to be able to use the compute resources. Once you were there, you could use that as a launching pad to break into whatever else. So eventually people did realize that security is a problem. And the way they handled it was the same way they handled machines when they broke down. So memory problems, for example. Uh, how do you detect memory faults? So a lot of computers would do memory checks when they boot up. Or a program, how would you detect a program uh, when it has a fault in the program? Or your hardware, when your hardware have a fault? So there's this notion of detection, we're detecting things. So they thought, well, we can detect broken things really well. So how about if we treat security like that and say if it's broken, we'll just detect it. Now this field is signal classification, signal detection, signal classification. It's called different things in, in different areas. Um, and where does it come from? So I wasn't, I, it says stories from experience. I was not in World War II, so I'm not that old. So. But in World War II, something really interesting happened. Uh, radar was invented, radar was used. And radar was all about sending signals up into the sky and getting echoes back from aircraft. And it was done in this 3D space, right? So it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just looking at something that's right in front of the camera. It could be anywhere in the sky. So that's, that's one issue. Now, we had signal detection before that. We had radios and TV. But with radio and TV, you had a signal that was broadcast. And the person broadcasting the signal was the same person or the same you know, group of people. Uh, that were detecting the signal and saying, oh, that's the radio message that we transmitted and we can demodulate. They would modulate it onto a carrier wave and then they would demodulate it. And this demodulation was this signal detection. They did it really well. World War II with radar, they lost control of the background signal, of the background noise. So with radio and television, there's this carrier wave that you control and you know exactly what it looks like. And so when you put another signal on that, you know what that other signal is because you know what the first signal is that, was, that it's writing on. With radar, you've got the sky as your background, and your sky changes. There could be clouds, there could be other aircraft, or, or birds, or, or uh, dirigibles, or, or whatever in the sky. There could be weather conditions. And so the signal detection, the science of signal detection, and the mathematics of signal detection, 
had to evolve from this idea of, oh, we know what the background looks like to we're not sure what the background looks like. It could be anything. Maybe not anything. We've got an idea, but you know, it's, it varies quite a bit. And one thing that comes out of that when you don't know what the background signal is, you don't know for sure, is that sometimes you make mistakes. Sometimes you make errors and you miss something that you should have caught or you get a false alarm, a false positive. So these ideas should sound similar with today's detection systems. So today's detection systems are coming from this history. And I've got two things here, bifurcating vector spaces and cursive dimensionality. I'm going to use a visual aid. Now this is your crash course in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So the secret of all the AI mystery is here. It's just in more dimensions. So let's say we have a problem. And the problem is that we need to tell somebody how to tell apart the triangles from the squares on the left side there. Now, because of the way they're arranged in that box, instead of trying to give them precise detail of what a triangle looks like, because those triangles might be rotated also, and that's, that's a hard problem. Instead, what we can do is we can draw an imaginary line and say, okay, look, it's really easy. All the triangles are going to be on one side of the line, and all the squares are going to be on the other side of the line. And that's all you have to do. When you see a triangle or a square, just tell me which side of the line it's on, and I can tell you if it's a triangle or a square. Very easy. This is bifurcating a vector space. So we have a space, in this case it's a two-dimensional space, and we divided that space in half. So some things are on one side, or two parts. Not necessarily half, but two parts. Some things are on one side of a line, and other things are on the other side. Now that's great for that example. For this example, the problem is, where do you draw your line? And there is no line on a 2D surface like that that you can draw that will separate the triangles and the squares. You can't do it with one straight line. There is a way to do it, though, if you add an extra dimension. So imagine if the squares were lifted up out of the screen and are floating here. So the same relative positions in these two dimensions but they're out here, and all the triangles are back here on the screen. Imagine that. And then what we can do is we can draw a line or a plane and divide it and say, well, now we can cut it in half. And the heart of machine learning and AI. So in the image on the right, when we brought them out, we added an extra dimension. If these, if we have more shapes in here, and they're arranged in more complex ways, then we're going to need more than three dimensions. We might need four dimensions or five dimensions. That's not something we can visualize here. But we can model it mathematically, these high dimensional vector spaces. And we can have all sorts of interesting things in this high dimensional space. But the question of where to draw our line or our plane in however dimensions we have becomes complicated by the fact that if we don't have enough shapes in our data set here, then we're not necessarily going to have just one line that we can draw. There might be different lines that we could draw. So for example, in this one on the right, we could take that line and move it some up to the right, move it some down to the left. There's some wiggle room in there. But if you talk about a high dimensional space, there's an awful lot of wiggle room. And this is where something called the cursive dimensionality becomes a big problem. Because you can't put enough shapes in there to be able to have only a single line or a single plane that's going to divide these shapes into two different places. And this is the heart of the problem with signal detection, is how do you get a machine to automatically figure out where the line should be drawn? You have to train a machine, or the machine's got to train itself, but if you don't have sufficient data, it's not gonna, there's not going to be an answer to the problem. And eventually, you're going to have these false positives, 
and you're going to miss things, the false negatives also. And that's real, the, really the crux of the problem with machine learning, with AI, uh, with signal detection, and classification in general. This slide is the second most important slide. So the first one is that the way we normally think about things for security does not scale, it doesn't go forward into the future. Eventually, we run out of money, we run out of resources, because the cost of attack goes so low, the cost of defense goes so high, and there's, there's not a good ending to that story. The second most important slide is it's all about control. And the important thing here is the issue is not cybersecurity. You might say the issue is crime, maybe. You might say the issue is warfare, maybe. But it's really all about one entity or agent, something, a machine or a person, establishing control over another person, entity, agent, machine, whatever. And you can think about this in many different contexts. You can think about this for, um, for walking down the street and somebody tries to rob you. Somebody tries to take your money, right? What they're really doing, first and foremost, is they're trying to control you. They're trying to get you to do whatever it is that they want you to do, that you would be under their control. You could see this in warfare. So the example of you need to take a territory, you need to take an area. You want to control it. You want to put your assets there, either have them there physically or have something remotely that you can use to control that area, that location. You may have machines. So our notion of cybercrime is really all about control. It's about somebody getting in and controlling your computer or your network and making it do what they want it to do. Now, there is what I would consider a myth that I'll speak on. And it's the myth that there are these different kinds of cybersecurity attacks, and depending on what kind of cybersecurity attack it is, you need to do different things. And that's kind of true, but for the most part, I, I don't think it is. Because really, first and foremost, it's about control. And then what someone does after they get control, that you know, that's a different question. So take ransomware, for example. Ransomware gets tremendous media attention. The reality is that if you look at all the threats in the world, the threat of ransomware is actually not that prevalent. But it gets a lot of media attention. And I've heard people ask me questions like, well, how do you stop this ransomware attack? And it's really the same answer as how you stop any cyber attack. Well, don't let the adversary take control of your machine. Because if they don't have control of your machine, they're not going to make it do what they want it to do. They're not going to make it encrypt your files. They're not going to make it lock your doors or, or whatever. So keep them out, right? Don't let them establish control. It's a really important concept. It sounds simple, but it's, it's, uh, it's the pillar that ties cybersecurity to many other fields, uh, like criminal investigation and warfare. It makes them all the similar kind of subject. So I, I've actually mentioned the universities. Um, the, the issue of going to the university first is that if you have a machine and you're at home with it, a computer, you don't necessarily want to use your computer to do whatever it is you want to do, right? Because you want to be anonymous, or maybe you have a, a computer that's not very powerful and you want to do something more powerful. So you go to a university because the university has better computers. They're better connected. They're more powerful. They're available all the time. And so from an attacker perspective, you want to assert control over those university computers and you want to make them into your resources. Not the university's resources. You want to control them. Now from a university perspective, let's say you're there and you're managing all those computers, you lose if somebody comes in and takes control over that computer. You think that you're managing that asset, but if someone actually comes in and seizes control over that computer, you don't have that asset anymore. It's not really your asset. You think it is, but it's not, because they can make it do whatever they want. And then once somebody grabs a university computer, and by the way, I'm not suggesting that 
anyone go out and hack a university computer. And I'm not suggesting that that's the only launching point that people use, but it's a very common one, and it always has been, actually. So once you establish that computer at, let's say, a university, you don't want to stop there. Let's say you're an attacker. You don't want to stop there because now you control one university computer. But wouldn't it be better to control two? Isn't two better than one? Wouldn't four be better than two? Why not get them all, control all of them? And so one of the big motivators is to assert control over a resource, motivators of an attacker, or to assert control over a resource, seize control, and then to increase that span of control. And again, this concept, this principle, is not just a cybersecurity principle or concept. This applies in any kind of criminal attack. This applies in warfare in general. Once you seize control of something, you want to use that as a launching point and increase your span of control. Because what happens if you lose one of those machines? What happens if the network connection goes down? You might lose it because somebody finds you out. You might lose it because somebody turns it off. You might lose something because of a natural disaster. You want to assert control and you want to increase that span of control. And how do you assert that control? How do you get it? By having intelligence, by having data, information. Right? You want to know what you're stepping into and you want to know what all the parameters of that thing are. And the more you know about it, the more you can control it. Again, this is a concept that's not just cybersecurity. This applies to many different areas. So, fixing networks. I have a story. I don't know if anyone has had the misfortune of being in this position. Uh, not this position, but the position of having to fix a network that's broken. Um, sometimes, uh, network engineers, they, they go into a job, and I, I've been in this scenario before. Uh, where you, you dumped into a network and you, they say it's broken, you need to fix it. And you say, okay, great, where's the documentation? They say, well, we don't have documentation. Why not? Well, we don't know, you know, okay, well, let me talk to the person that set it up. And they say, well, that person's not here anymore. Oh, okay. Um, so th they must have passed that information on to the next person that took the job, right? Well, no, they didn't pass it down. Oh, okay, well, they must have left recently, and I can call, tell me where they went. And, well, no, they actually left 10 years ago. Really? So how many people? Well, we've actually had seven system administrators come in and leave since that network was set up, and so and now it's broken. So you go into this network, or these machines, and, and there's no documentation. There's no one you can call, uh, nothing you can look up at all. And what you have to do is you have to start poking things. You say, well, I don't know, I'll just try to go to this machine, or I'll just unplug this cable and see what happens, see if anybody yells, or I'm going to reboot this router and see what happens, or I'm going to do a ping or a trace route to that point, other point of the network. So, so I see some of you are smiling, so some of you may have, ex have, it ex may have had experiences like this. It's very, very frustrating. It's very frustrating because you don't know what's going on, and every time you do something wrong, somebody screams. Right? Somebody says, ah, you broke my whatever, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll put it back. You know, I'm just trying to figure out the network so I can fix this other problem. When an adversary goes in and they're trying to seize control over a resource, they're in that same situation. They're right, right where you would be if you were trying to get into this network and you're trying to fix it, except for them fixing it is sort of fixing it. It's fixing it for them. It's fixing it so that they can make it do whatever it is that they want it to do. But they need information for that. They need more information is better, and they need high quality information. And so now we talked about signal, or I talked about signal detection before, this idea of how do we tell if something is, is abnormal, how do we detect something. They have to do the same thing. Now. They have to go out there and they have to take observations in the network or the machine and they have to say, well, let me try to figure out what this is. Is this a path from A to B or not? And it's uh, a curve that shows the trade-off between uh, precision and recall. And these, these terms have different uh, labels and different fields. Um, but precision and recall. So what's, what's recall? Recall is if I'm looking for something, um, can I find all the things I'm looking for? 
right? If I'm doing radar and I'm looking for planes, uh, can, can I find all the planes? Or maybe I can only find 80% of the planes in the sky using my radar system, in which case my recall is 0.8. Precision is when I come back and I say, hey, here's a plane, is it really a plane or not? Is it a false positive, right? Is it one of these false alarms? So if my precision is 0.8 or 80%, that means 80% of the time when I tell you it's a plane, it's really a plane. But 20% of the time, it's not really a plane, and it's just a false alarm. And this should sound familiar for people who have worked with intrusion detection systems or other uh, SIM products that will give you these alerts on a dashboard and say, hey, we found something. Well, sometimes they miss things, and sometimes uh, they tell you there's a problem when there's not really a problem. And there's actually mathematics behind this that say that problem's never going away. It doesn't matter what anybody does, because of these issues of uh, bifurcating the vector space and the curse of dimensionality and the fact that the background noise, you never know exactly what it is, all of these things conspire against you and say it's an unwinnable game with detection. And that cuts both ways. It's whoever's doing the detection. It's an unwinnable game. There's always ways to prevent the detection. So uh, CB radios. I, I don't know if anyone is familiar with those. It's uh, citizen band radios. In the United States, they're used a lot in uh, trucks that haul cargo uh, on long hauls. And they're, they're like personal radios that are inside the truck. And the person driving will use it to talk uh, in a short range uh, with other truckers with CB radios. And so they'll, if they see a problem on the road, uh, they'll get on their radio and they'll send a message to whoever is in earshot uh, within the radio waves and say, hey, there's a problem on such and such. Or if they want to know about, uh, they'll use it to track police presence to say, hey, is there a speed trap here or something like that. It's just a way for them to talk to each other locally. Now, the curious thing about a CB radio is it has a knob on it called a squelch knob. And the squelch knob uh, is there because sometimes uh, you drive over hills or sometimes there's bad weather and so the radio signals are weak. If you have a weak radio signal, you want to essentially turn up your gain. You want your signal detector that's detecting the transmission of the other truck drivers. You want that to be more powerful. And so you turn the squelch knob down uh, that lets you hear that. Now the downside of that is that you hear this static cut in on the radio because the device, as you turn this knob, doesn't know what it's looking for, it just thinks it's a signal. And so sometimes, a very, very weak signal, it can't tell it apart from static that's in the air. And so you hear a lot of static. On the other side, if you crank the squelch knob in the other direction, because all the signals are really strong, if you turn it up too high, then you won't hear anybody. Right? It won't, nothing will meet this threshold. No signal will be strong enough. And moving this squelch knob is basically manipulating the ROC curve, the receiver operating characteristics curve. So that's, this is actually where it comes from, this idea of uh, radio signals. So whenever somebody talks about detection, like an IDS, for example, or lights on a dashboard on a SIM product, that detection is governed by something like a squelch knob. You may or may not be given that control uh, if it's an intrusion detection, detection system that is rule-based, then that squelch knob is translated into rules. And whether you have a sufficient number or high-quality rules depends on how many false alarms you get, how many false positives, or how many things you miss. Um, and anyone who's worked with an IDS in a, in a live environment should this should sound familiar that you, know, you can over-tune it so that it starts missing things or you can under-tune it so that too many things come in. Any kind of machine learning system has the same problem. Machine learning is all about having a machine automatically adjust that squelch knob. That squelch knob, by the way, is the position of the line when you're bifurcating a vector space. So by turning that knob, what you're doing is you're positioning that line or that plane in in-dimensional space. And usually it's just a knob. You can slide it here or there. Ideally, you want a very complex contour, but it's, the problem is getting those complex contours is, is a very, very hard problem. Uh, and in the general case, it's unsolvable. 
So that's the other thing I haven't mentioned here, is that this, this problem of signal detection in the general case is actually an unsolvable problem. So essentially we're talking about something called uh, Turing's halting problem, if anyone's familiar with computer science, which is you can never know, you can never have a general pur purpose program that knows for sure whether another program is going to run and then eventually halt or terminate. You can never tell that. Um, and it's not an engineering problem, it's actually a math problem, it's, it's provable. So the other part here is natural language processing. And so I've done a lot of natural language process, processing stuff. I've, I've done research in it also. Um, it's basically taking human language and um, detecting things in it, translating human language into structured data, let's say database entries. And so the funny thing about natural language um, is that nobody speaks the same and that even if somebody that their word choice and everything seems perfectly you know, in tune with somebody else, there's always differences. There are always differences. And so these differences, um, it go back to thinking of bifurcating the vector space. These differences are moving these shapes around in this high dimensional space. And then to make it work, and, and if you tune it, if you train on what's called the corpus, the collection of uh, natural language documents, if you train something, so that, hey, I can always detect when somebody is talking about a terrorist attack, for example. So let's, this is a, a, an application of natural language processing. So scan all of this stuff, or, or let's say emails. This is a, maybe a better example. Scan all the emails at our organization and tell me whenever somebody is talking about doing harm to the organization in any way. Sabotage, embezzlement, fraud, whatever. Show me all the emails. So that's a natural language processing problem. So the problem is that even if you train it on millions of documents and you say, hey, with 99% accuracy, we know we can pull this data out. The problem is in six months from now, one year from now, the language that everyone's using in these emails has changed. And it's changed because they've got different projects, because people have been promoted, people have left the company, new people have joined. And so the position of these shapes, and these shapes by the way, represent, they're called features. Uh, so features that were extracted from whatever it is that you're trying to analyze. So these shapes are actually moving over time. So this problem of figuring out where the line goes, it's even harder because now, over time, these shapes are moving. Day by day, hour by hour. So anytime you see that one of these news reports that says researcher comes out with super awesome method that guarantees 100% detection of uh, awesome hacker attack, it's it, it's not true, right? It, it's, they did it at a very small snapshot in time. I'll give you an example. There was a big news release, I forget uh, who put it out just recently, about uh, someone saying, uh, well, some background, okay? So if somebody compromises a system, oftentimes they'll have a, a tether back to a command and control server somewhere else so that they can remote control that system. And it's in their interest to have that tether be encrypted because if it's encrypted traffic, then it's harder for uh, you to write rules to detect command and control signals in this. Not impossible, but harder. And so what they said is, even in these encrypted links, the researchers said, even in these encrypted links going back, we can still tell with super high accuracy when bad things are going through this traffic. And the news made it look like, you know, awesome, super awesome. And so I went and I read the paper, and it found, I found out that what they were doing is this is the gist of it. They said, okay, what we do is we look, and if it's a TLS secure connection, then we look as part of that protocol that negotiates the feature set that's allowed, and if it is a feature set that's very robust, we just let it pass. If it's a feature set that only supports one or two characteristics of that encrypted communication, we label it as bad. And it was as simple as that. It was their hypothesis was a hacker is going to do something lazy and they're going to have a very superficial encrypted connection, whereas if it's the business, they're going to have a very robust encrypted communication. That's how we're going to tell them apart. Well, I can tell you what happened next. News article went out, paper got published, organized crime read the paper, because don't think for an instant that the hacker community is not watching all of this stuff. And a lot of it is backed by organized crime read the paper, understood, and said, hey, you know, tomorrow 
we have to start using robust TLS connections for our command and control. And then what happens to the detection quality of what the research did? It goes right out the window, right? Because they trained the adversary on how to defeat them. So cybersecurity is a zero-sum game. Think about playing a game, um, like a game of Go. I don't know how many people are familiar with Go. There are these stones you put on a grid. Um, or, or checkers is another, or chess. So there's a space, and you put your piece on that space. And if you've got your space, your piece on that space, you control it. And if you look at all the assets in your organization, somebody controls it. It's you or somebody else. Shadow IT is an example of somebody in your organization controlling that resource, that resource while the proper IT staff does not. Okay? It's not necessarily malicious, but it's this notion that you don't have control, somebody else has control. But here's a, a story about this issue of control that didn't turn out well for me. So, I was responsible for a server, had a bunch of stuff running on it, and I noticed it was going slow one day. And so I went into the server, and I saw there were a lot of curious processes running in the server, and I thought, wow, how do all these things get started? And then I traced it back, and I realized that someone had compromised the server and gotten into it. So I said, well, I'll start cleaning it out. I was probably at a tremendous disadvantage because I'm sure they had a lot of automated tools lined up and ready to go in case of it. Uh, in case of them losing control. And every time I tried to take control back, within 60 seconds, I saw they took it back. And I could see the new process of starting up. And this wasn't just automated, this was somebody actually coming in through back doors in the server. Eventually, I lost control over that server. And I lost control because I thought, at the time, I was fighting a fair fight and I was going to win. But the problem was that you don't want to fight a fair fight. right? When you're trying to take control back, it's your machine. You want control. You don't want a fair fight. And this notion of not a fair fight applies in many domains. Um, and, and warfare is the one where I have pulled it from. Uh, because if, you're, if your life is on the line, you don't, want, you don't want a fair fight. You want to use any method you can to get the adversary to do things that will make them lose. And you should think the same way when you're on your assets, controlling your assets, that you should not be taking a passive role. You shouldn't say, hmm, I wonder what's going on. Oh, it looks like I need to do something here. You should say it's yours and do whatever it takes, even preemptive things, to make sure that someone else is not going to wrest control of over that server. So now I'm going to look forward. And these are the things that explain that first slide that say, hey, things aren't going to turn out well. So there's uh, increasing processing power. And these are basic things, right? So we think that because we can use GPUs, we can use faster CPUs, we can use clusters, that we're better at detection, we're better at security, we're whatever. The problem is that the adversary has the exact same advantage. They can do these exact same things and turn them against us. So imagine this scenario where somebody comes into your machine and they actually hijack the graphics processing unit, the graphics card, so you don't even know that it's going on. You don't see it in your CPU. And they use that to do a brute force attack of the passwords on the machine itself. Or a brute force attack of the passwords somewhere else in your network. And you don't even see it. So all of these things that we think are going to help us with defense are the exact same tools they're going to help the attacker. Increase connectivity. So this is my, your network is like a sponge story. So people have seen sponges, right? They, they soak up water, they get holes. The reason they work is because on the exterior surface, there's holes everywhere. And then once water gets inside of it, water can go anywhere inside of it. Right? There's just tremendous connectivity inside of a sponge. And we used to think that we had these perimeters, these borders, and then we realized we don't really have that, that's because our networks are like sponges. There are so many different ways, even if we think something is locked down so tight, there are so many ways to get information into and out of that network, it's crazy. And in the, uh, you, if you follow 
um, I, I'll say the research on the internet, you'll see all sorts of new ways are being discovered or revealed for uh, really, really interesting ways to get information into or out of a network and to get it from one node to another. These, this increasing connectivity, this, this sponge thing, increases the avenues of approach. So, so what does that mean? So here's a military perspective. So in, let's say in warfare, in battle, you want to know where someone can go so you can guard that position, right? So if you're talking about a physical terrain, it's, it's not as hard to protect certain areas. And these areas are called avenues of approach. Someone wants to get to you, somebody wants to get to an area, you control it. Well, if you can identify these areas of approach, you can set up defenses. And this should sound like a firewall or an IDS. You find an area where you think your adversary is going to go, and then you put your defenses there. The problem is that when we, our network is like a sponge, when people can get from anywhere to anywhere, we no longer have these clear avenues of approach. We no longer have these clear gates or roads or passages that we can guard. And so we never know where the adversary is going to go. And we just have to guard everything all the time. And another thing is AI. So a lot of people say, hey, AI, artificial intelligence, that's going to solve it, right? That's going to, we've got these algorithms that are going to tell us when we have a problem. And, and I've already talked about the AI problem in that the, the adversary can actually take AI techniques and apply it against us to find our defenses, to find ways through our defenses. They can look at the AI techniques that we use and reverse engineer them so that it was an outright cyber attack instead of just ransomware. Now we can see that these things can go very, very quickly. And the way to handle that, these automated attacks, is to have automated defenses, right? Because if you got, I, I was on, on one network and I was watching that there was uh, voice over IP was being attacked. And the, from the time the attacks, attacks started to the time it ended was less than 60 seconds swept through the network, went through all the devices, did its stuff, less than 60 seconds. If I had been, I wasn't responsible for that network, I was just monitoring at the time, but if I had been responsible for that network and it was just manual response, there's nothing I could have done, right? So what's good security? So you should tell by now that I'm not that excited about detection. I think detection is a losing game. Um, you want to control the assets. You want to influence the adversary. And the way, in my opinion, to do this is to change the odds. So who does this and, and why do they do it and how do they do it? For example, uh, casinos are a great example. Casinos, when you go into a casino, somebody thinks, oh, I'm going to win a lot of money. Well, you're not. You're not going to win a lot of money. And it's not that you're not going to win a lot of money because when they see that you're winning, you, you're, they're going to stop you or something like that. They might, they might, but the real thing that's going to stop you is the probability of it, right? It's, they're making it so that you're always going to lose in the end. The, the odds say if you play roulette every time, you're going to lose all your money. Uh, banks and strong encryption, similar thing. So strong encryption works not because it is, it, it's great at detecting people breaking the encryption. It works because it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of analysis to figure out what the key was for that encrypted message. By the way, public service announcement, I don't know if uh, anyone here knows uh, who's interested in cryptography or encryption, but RSA 1024 and RSA 2048 uh, for those um, encryption methods, they've been, uh, vulnerabilities have been discovered. So if anybody cares about it. So I think there's new patches for libgcrypt and P, uh, GPG. Um, it's a pretty, pretty serious uh, breach. So uh, banks, so a bank vault, you've got all this time that it takes you to get through a bank vault, right? And then by the time you get to that vault, somebody's responded, somebody's already get, gotten to you. And then military units, right? You, you don't want the fair fight. You want to do something to change the odds, change the probability, whether it's uh, camouflage, whether it's decoys, 
whether it's uh, anything you can do, whether it's cutting off logistics and supply lines, uh, disincentivizing certain actions on the battlefield, anything that you can do to influence the adversary's behavior to make them do things that reduce the probability that they can take control over the asset that you're trying to maintain control over. And that's what I would say is, is the, the underlying principle of good security. Good security is not about taking something that you already do and doing it better, but it's changing the way that you look at the problem and saying, well, we're going to make it harder, just naturally harder, not easier, like way back at the beginning where we said we're going to make it easier for the machines, uh, people to access these machines, we're actually going to make it harder. And that's, that's the issue. And so here's what I did. I'm going to talk about my, so you, you've seen what my thought process is. And uh, I'm going to talk about something I built and why I built it. And uh, keep in mind, I'm a technical guy, though, also. Uh, so, so these are the things that I wanted. Right? I, I wanted this out of the security product because of all these issues I saw. And I saw that detection was just intractable. I actually went down the whole detection road. I said, OK, let's break it up into all these different uh, vector spaces. And it, it, you just lose every time because the background noise changes or the signal changes, so let's say virus signature changes. The background noise, people can influence the network. They can run uh, dual red team attacks on a network. So this, the obligatory Sun Tzu quote, was, which sums it up right there. Um, so, the, so these are things I want, right? I couldn't find. I said, I want something that's going to influence what the adversary does. I don't want to detect them. I want something that's going to automatically launch countermeasures. And I want something that's really easy to maintain. Because what I did is I went out and I looked for open source tools. That's the first thing I did. I said, I want something that's going to basically stand up like an armada of things for me and, um, and be easy to use. And everything was so hard to install, hard to maintain. Uh, hard to integrate with other tools. Uh, the, so they didn't necessarily have automatic countermeasures. Um, and I wanted situational awareness. I wanted immediate situational awareness. I didn't want something that's going to go through and crunch numbers for, for an hour before it tells me what's going on. I wanted to immediately see what's in the network. And I didn't want to have to instrument anything to do that. And uh, I didn't want to have to reconfigure anything. Like I didn't want to have to put NetFlow in everything. And uh, finally here, I wanted it to change the adversary behavior. I mean, that was the big thing that I wanted. I wanted a tool that would, on my behalf, do things that change the odds of this game of control. And so these are pictures, for example, of the diagram. So green nodes are live nodes, and uh, these amber ones are decoy messages that are being sent to adversaries. Um, but I knew that I could never know who was good or bad on the network. And so what I needed to do was change what the adversary saw. Uh, and, then, um, and then once I can get the adversary to take moves, I can immediately say, it's not a detection issue, but it's saying that I got them to step on this spot. I got them to go into that spot, and I knew that Whoever was going to go into that spot was somebody that I tricked to go there. And it's this notion of tricking them into doing things uh, that I use to get around that idea. And then these tricks that I put out, I put out billions of them. So it wasn't just an, an issue of, hey, I've got a dozen or a thousand or a hundred. There were billions deployed and automatically. And it wasn't something that actually, um, they weren't real assets. They were just, I just wanted to create illusions. Uh, in in uh, there's this, this notion of called meekening in, um, uh, in military circles. When you, you've got an aircraft, and you, let's say it's an enemy aircraft, and you want that enemy aircraft to go somewhere else. You don't want it to go where you want it to go. Or I'm sorry, you don't want it to go where it wants to go. You want to draw it off course. And one way to do that is to take its, its navigation beacons that it's using to figure out where it is and where it's going and spoof them and say, oh, your navigation beacon's over here, or your navigation beacon's over there. And then you can draw them off course. You could do this with ships and lighthouses, too, for example, if you want to steer them into some rocks. So you want to draw them off course. So I, it was this idea that, hey, if I could just take this notion of meekening and I could just draw someone off course, I can draw an adversary. Because what's driving an adversary? 
adversary is driving to explore, to gather information. They're, they're trying to establish more and more control. They're expanding control. And if I could draw them out and get them to go to some space where my users don't go, then I've got them. And then once I've got them, I can kick them off the network. Because I, I don't want to study them. I just want them out. And so uh, I put in this thing that does automatic host isolation. So it can automatically disconnect them from the network. And then lots of stuff, integration stuff. So if anybody's interested in that stuff, I can talk about that after the talk. So that was the way I think about security. This is what I did about it. Um, I think most important, what I would want, I, this material in this, uh, in this presentation is actually, I've taken what was uh, a two-day seminar. And the seminar is much more uh, interesting than a short talk. It's actually, I go into a lot of military history. There's a lot of games we play with the audience. Uh, where uh, we take this idea of detection, we kind of show why detection fails ultimately, and this notion of if you can control the adversary's, adversary's behavior, how is it that you can almost guarantee that you're going to win as the defender every time if you somehow assert control over the adversary? And again, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak here.